Okay, everybody, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to Fort Collins Skeptics in the Club's annual event called Skeptic Camp 2018. And if everyone wants to recite the uh, skeptics motto with me by raising the devil fingers and putting your left hand over your belly button, the skeptic oath says, I don't believe shit until I do. <laughs> so today we're going to have a lineup of, uh, I guess six, we just had a, another volunteer to give another talk in the middle, uh, but our first presenter is Linda Rosa, and she's going to give a presentation on the year in skeptic activism in Colorado. Our second speaker is Doug Holland, and he's going to present on uh, when normal people believe crazy things, why stating facts won't persuade them, and what does work to persuade. Our third speaker is Caleb Hendrick, and he's going to be discussing the loot box, a case for industry regulation in video gaming. And then we'll have a break after that, and uh, kind of an informal discussion about the life and memory of Stephen Hawking. After that, then we've got the wonderful Susan Gerbic is a German. Gerbic, sorry about that. And uh, her presentation is called The March for Science. Now what? Guerrilla skepticism on Wikipedia. And last we had, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, in the, in, maybe in the uh, section on Stephen Hawking, we also have Howard, and he's going to be doing some talks about uh, M.C. Hawking and uh, the alter ego of Stephen Hawking, which is now technically dead as well. And the last presenter will be uh, Mark Edwards. Uh, I didn't have a title for Mark's presentation, so I made one up. I called it, When Magicians Don't Have Their Audience's Consent. <laughs> All right, so our first speaker is Miss Linda Rosa. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for getting my name weird slide show up and working. Uh, there's a lot to report about what's been going on in the last year, and it's been more than a year since we had a <coughs> skeptics meeting. So that meant we had two legislative we have two legislative sessions to report on. And always showing up at the Capitol, wanting something or the these degreed nature paths for twenty years, they worked to get regulation. And finally, in 2013, they became regulated. Not licensed like they wanted, but, but uh, registered. And uh, in the 2017 session, they came and they, they had their first sunset review, and they wanted prescription authority. Um, uh, and the House, the House Democrats love naturopaths. They will give them anything they want. And so they passed the Sunset Bill allowing them to have prescription authority. But when they hit the Senate, things were a little different. Um, the senators were more open to hearing uh, about the problems in their practice. And one in particular, that the naturopaths, a lot of them, were passing themselves off as physicians and that they had attended medical school. And that's a violation of not only the naturopath bill, but also the Medical Practice Act. And since they were doing this, the senators thought, well, ND looks too much like MD. It might be, might be taken as a typo to the public. So they changed their uh, official title to registered naturopath which was something the naturopaths really hated. They hated it so much that they started threatening one of uh, their opponents in the Senate. Um, and it, I never found out what the threats were, but they were from a past president of the Colorado Naturopathic Society, and it, and it went national, what happened. So the bill passed, it would be hot, very unlikely that the legislature would deregulate the nature of pass, but they were no prescription authority and they were stuck with the title they hated. Um, oh, these people are ones who helped us. They uh, came and became a panel for the sunset review process and they urged deregulation of the practice, but were not heard. Uh, then last summer, Channel 4 News in Denver picked up on this story that a lot of naturopaths were passing themselves off as physicians, 
and they asked us for some help with gathering data about that. So Larry Sonner, myself, and Mark Johnson, he's, he's a real powerhouse when it comes to posing naturopaths. He's the uh, medical director of Jeff Rosen's department. So after, a few months after this aired, and then the big kerfuffle that we had just had at the uh, legislative session, I thought, I'm going to go back to their websites and see if any of them have decided not to talk, not to refer to themselves as physicians, and nothing had changed. Uh, we did a careful survey and found that 34 of them were referring to themselves as physicians, and another 22 were using uh, language to induce the public to believe that they were. And uh, usually you can't talk about filing complaints about uh, any particular person, but I'm not going to name people here. We did file a complaint against these 56 of uh, the intro past, and it appears that the investigation is still pending. Uh, then, a couple months ago, we got to have another legislative session, and the naturopaths are back to try and get rid of that registered naturopath title that they're stuck to, even though less than 20 of them are currently using this title as the law requires. Uh, of course, the House Democrats, the controller of House, they passed this bill almost unanimously, but uh, the senators, I'll go back to that, the senators remembered what had happened in the last session and they killed this bill. Okay. And this, that's one reason why I'm against term limits. <laughs> you like to have legislators who have a memory about all these, what these quacks have been doing. In the past. Uh, we have some really nasty naturopaths in this in this state. There's a bunch of them out in Durango that uh, they came out in the newspaper, this is the Durango Herald, saying that they're giving mistletoe extract and mistletoe homeopath preparations to people with cancer. Now not only is it illegal to give any of either of these things to, uh, uh, to a patient, especially for cancer, it's illegal to even import this stuff where it's made in Germany. So uh, these people were worthy of a complaint, and even the FDA was quite pleased to know about them. Okay, then we've got other naturopaths who are offering to the public escherotic treatment for dysplasia of the cervix. Dysplasia of the cervix is where you get this change in normal cells to a kind of precancerous state. Uh, and these naturopaths claimed to, to be treating this with blood root. Uh, and blood root is a major component of that infamous black salve uh, treatment for uh, <clears throat> well, it's usually it used to be old farmers who didn't have the time or money to deal to mess around with uh, a tumor, and they they could buy this really cheap black salve, and you can get it today off of Amazon. It is a wildly corrosive, unpredictable material when it's applied to. Uh, human tissue, and it's the last thing you want on your service. Uh, 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 then one of the one of the major concerns here in Colorado is a really bad, bad, bad mental health practice called attachment therapy. It used to be called holding therapy, compression therapy, rage reduction, rebirthing, and it has killed kids. It intentionally inflicts uh, trauma to re-traumatize children, and it has very, very nasty uh, parenting methods and, uh, and its own quack diagnosis. Uh, here we start, because of some deaths in Colorado, we started out 
advocates for children in therapy. Uh, all the people involved in running this are good skeptics, trying to oppose abusive practices and to promote science-based mental health practices in the state. <coughs> Our state is really bad for that. Uh, this year there were high profile death trial or trials about death cases around the country. Uh, horrible uh, uh, details about the deaths of these children. They were all diagnosed with this quack diagnosis of uh, attachment disorder. Uh, they were these two girls in Iowa were starved to death in isolation, a terrible way for a child to die. Uh, that young boy uh, uh, talked to me <laughs> later if you'd like to learn the uh, details of his death. And here in Grand Junction, we have another girl. Uh, so you can imagine what we thought when we learned that Colorado's Department of Human Services was co-sponsoring the a, a conference in Denver last October that of a, an organization attached that is the trade organization for attachment therapists. This just uh, made us see, see red. Uh, not only were attachment therapists going to be speaking at this conference, but all kinds of bizarre, wacko types of mental health um, uh, practices were being promoted by this. So we geared up all sorts of complaints, sending them just to anybody who would listen. Uh, one of the things we did is we contacted the American Psychological Association to say, listen, they're giving uh, continuing education credits for this stuff. And, and one day before the conference began, the APA con uh, contacted the organizers and said, you know, most of these classes, you can't you can't offer CEs for them. Um, that helped us with that with the APA's action. That helped us get the attention of these two fine people. Is Dr. Jaden Webb? He's the medical director of the Office of Children, Youth, and Families at Colorado DHS. And Stephanie Villafuerte. She is the new child ombudsman for Colorado. They said. Uh, we'd like to uh, invite you over. Uh, we'll, we would like to have an hour to talk to you about your complaints. And <clears throat> quite frankly, we're used to uh, people calling us up after we've done a complaint and wanting to talk to us. And that is oftentimes, oftentimes a way of sort of dismissing uh, any people who are making complaints about things. Uh, we realized that we were talking to some uppy ups right here in uh, the system. So for a month we, <laughs> uh, oh, I put together this team. This Yay. was Jean Mercer, uh, who Craig knows Foster. more about attachment therapy than anybody, and Craig Foster, our well-known uh, fellow skeptic, uh, psychology professor at the Air Force Academy who teaches uh, critical thinking. And we, for a month, we just wanted to, we worked to get a presentation together for these two people that we thought would be just, you know, uh, would sell them on changing the policy of DHS from just any kind of fad therapy that comes their way, uh, oftentimes being very inhumane practices, to one that would be science-based. And, <clears throat> and we sent the materials ahead of time and whatnot. And to our amazement, we walked in the door and they said, you're our kind of people, we want to change, how do we do it? Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, we couldn't, it was one of those things that this is too good to, to, to be true. Uh, so we are now, right now, trying to uh, implement a total policy change for DHS for empirically supported therapies only. It is going to be a lot of work 
and it's going to take years to do this because it is going to be a tough sell to all these people who, in the department who love all sorts of fat therapies. But uh, this could be a game changer, a, a model for other states. Um, this doesn't seem like it would be a problem in Colorado. Lyme disease. We don't have the deer tick. We don't have, we, we just don't have Lyme disease. However, Colorado has chronic Lyme, this mythical, uh, unvalidated disease state that is just, uh, uh, some, it's a boon to all kinds of quacks. Okay? Uh, we know that Lyme disease can be uh, cured with a simple K, with a simple, uh, with uh, some doxycycline. These people think that <coughs> you take an antibiotic, you still have the, uh, the disease. Why Colorado is, has chronic Lyme now is because the poster child for chronic Lyme lives in Colorado, Olivia Goodrow. The story is that she contracted chronic Lyme, or Lyme disease when she was on vacation at age six in, in Missouri. Uh, and it appears that she's been treated for chronic Lyme now for five to six years. Um, and here are the medications, her medications at this wow. point. She's being treated with continual, long-term, several antibiotics wow. and anti-malarial herb supplements. So she takes 87 meds a day. Wow. And Jeez. is there, you know, if there's a reason why she still has bad days, <laughs> I, I don't find that uh, um, reasonable. And here's her Lyme literate doctor, Dr. Daniel Kindelier in Boulder. This guy throws everything plus the kitchen sink at chronic Lyme. I picked out some of the stranger things that he uh, recommends. The Royal Rife Machine, that must be a hundred years old by now. Uh, colloidal silver, so you can have, you can be a blue man group of blue, people. Uh, bee venom, homeopathy, bovine colostrum. IV and oral hydrogen peroxide, that'll kill you quick. That'll give you an air embolism to your heart. Uh, also, the UV treatment of blood, well, that, that wouldn't be a problem except they extract your blood, expose it to use the light, and then inject it back in. Thyroid placement, replacement, they give this even if your thyroid levels are normal. Uh, detoxing heavy metals, and they'll even take, think you should take out your, uh, your fillings. Hey, Linda. I'm, I'm not familiar with the rife machine. That doesn't sound great. Uh, what does it do? Yeah. Does it do you, do you, uh, you have a little book and it gives you the vibration, vibrations of any kind of parasite, virus, or bacteria. And you've got a machine that uh, it will adjust to the vibrations that will kill that particular organism. Wow. And so, yeah, it's, look at look it up, it's, 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 it's a fun machine, yeah. Um, next Saturday, a week from today, we're having the Lime, uh, Live Lime Foundation Gala down at the Denver Center for the Performing Arts. Uh, this is a big deal now. The first one raised $340,000 to help uh, Lyme, chronic Lyme victims with meds and for research. Uh, I also think that it's probably using money to uh, promote some of the bills that are <coughs> in various legislatures in the United States right now. So these bills would force doctors, if they pass, they would force doctors to uh, recognize the chronic Lyme diagnosis and force uh, insurance companies to pay for it. And the threat to us all is 
giving all these people this really long-term antibiotic therapy causes um, resistance, and that's a threat to all of us. Okay, I don't know. Is anybody familiar with no. parental alienation syndrome? No, it's not scary. Okay. Emily, she's <laughs> hanging around. Is this the Disney effect where everybody kills up the parents? <laughs> no, this is, it, it's not a new uh, quack diagnosis, but it is taking off right now like wildfire, and I don't think it quite has the attention of uh, the skeptics yet. Uh, I've just been uh, observing it. Uh, Parental alienation syndrome is something that supposedly the child of uh, divorced parents will get when typically the mother uh, is assumed to the mother is assumed to have a borderline personality disorder, and she makes the child ill with this uh, uh, this syndrome. Uh, try, trying to make the child reject the father and, <coughs> and tell lies about him. Uh, uh, this is something you see in divorce courts. What's happening is uh, typically fathers come into the court and say, this, my child has PAS. Uh, I need to get total custody. The mother should not have any kind of visitation. And we need to send this child off to therapy, which actually resembles more of a uh, cult deprogramming thing. Wow. It is pretty brutal on the child. And then mother is supposed to pay the $30,000 for the treatment. Uh, there is no lack of lawyers in Colorado who will press uh, a case for PAS. Wow. And right here in Colorado, in Fort Collins, we have this psychologist over at the university who's made it her mission to press for this uh, recognition of parental alienation syndrome. And then I just for fun, if I see how close at home here you can get this therapy, this bogus therapy, and right here in Fort Collins. Okay, fluoridation. We got nowhere with fluoridation this year. The big, the big embarrassment for Colorado is that Colorado Springs uh, is not, most of the city is not fluoridated. It only has about 0.2 parts per million and optimally you want to have at least 0.7. The rest the light purple area there is where it's under fluoridated. The rest of the city has naturally optimal fluoridation. Now, this is why this is particularly embarrassing is that the dentist, uh, Dr. McKay, about 100 years ago, discovered the uh, importance of fluoridation and fluoride to dental health in Colorado Springs. They ought to be erecting a statue to the guy there <laughs> instead of uh, you know, ignoring the need for fluoridation. Screw about their precious bodily fluids. <laughs> yeah, and now is really the time, I was really trying to get uh, dental organizations interested in this because you'll notice that up there, <coughs> high up there is the uh, Air Force Academy. The Department of Defense has ordered that this facility needs to have fluoridated water. Wow. So uh, it's perhaps something we can get going in the future, but it's kind of uh, frustrating right now. Uh, Craig Foster has been uh, busy this year. He wrote this uh, delightful art opinion piece in the Denver Post. Uh, where he's saying, uh, talking about uh, how he likes people criticizing the flat earthers but accepting other kinds of pseudosciences. Uh, 
what is that called? Cognitive dissonance yeah. about this. Yeah. Uh, he also got a very important uh, paper accepted in that, the journal Vaccine, uh, talking about this $100,000 vaccine challenge by the World Mercury Project, which is Kennedy's <coughs> project. And, and here you have these two jokers at a press conference offering up this, uh, this, this prize. This was actually just a gimmick, and uh, Dr. Foster uh, exposes why this would, uh, this was, nobody was going to earn this prize. If they, I should mention that the, that the challenge was to prove that tamarisol is safe. Well, that's already been done uh, thoroughly. So nothing's going to uh, impress them. Oh, uh, every year here since Colorado Skeptics got uh, established uh, by Antonio Brady, there's been the counter march to the march against Monsanto. So skeptics show up in May uh, promoting the G promoting GMO uh, technology. And the next one is on May 19th, and I highly recommend it. It's a lot of fun, and uh, hopefully good weather. Oh, okay. Oh, now, tomorrow happens to be the 20th anniversary of Emily, Emily Rosa's therapeutic touch uh, study. Woo -woo, which wow. It's her fourth grade experiment that got published in in JAMA, and uh, on April 1st, so the therapeutic touch people said it was a uh, April Fool's joke. <laughs> the joke was on them. Okay, is anybody not familiar with this study? Okay, uh, Brian, could you start the Started out, uh, I thought it was Emily had this idea to see if therapeutic touch people could really feel something. She was she was curious about that. I didn't think she'd Watch get any movie. subjects. Here, Priestess Jones says she's pulling out someone's negative energy and shaking it away. I'm struck by how similar it is to what's being done right now in mainstream American hospitals. It's called therapeutic touch, and it's practiced in hundreds of medical centers, even during surgery. In Connecticut, Nurse Ann Miner does therapeutic touch on Lisa Brackett to help treat her leukemia. Oh. The nurse supposedly feels, without touching, three or four inches away, feels the defective energy pouring out. I can feel where the energy is balanced and where it's not balanced. I can feel where it's intense. I can feel it's depleted. Then she says she channels the healing energy of the universe through her hands to you. There's no scientific proof that this works, but the patient says that doesn't matter. I don't need explanations because I have faith in the process. That's a really wonderful thing when you feel helpless, terrified, when you're given a diagnosis like I was. It's hard to argue with satisfied patients. But two years ago, a nine-year-old girl in Colorado thought that on her fourth grade science project, she put therapeutic touch to the test. Today I'm going to test you on how well you can feel the human energy field. Emily Rose's test was simple. She asked practitioners of therapeutic touch to feel the energy from her hand. But first, she had them put their hands through a towel and a piece of cardboard so they couldn't see where her hand was. She didn't ask them to heal anything. She just asked the most basic okay. question. Tell me. Which of your hands do you think my hand is over? Left. Again and again, touching the piece <coughs> failed the test. Left. <coughs> Amazingly, they were volunteering to take the test. And even when they right. failed to do better at picking the correct hand than they would have done flipping a coin, right. their faith in their skills was not dimmed. Okay. This woman guessed right only three times out of ten. How do you think the test went? I think it went very well. Okay, you got one point, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, not really. Um, so I thought if you got 
four out of ten where they thought you'd pass. And obviously they didn't know their statistics. <laughs> we asked more than a dozen therapeutic touch specialists to come here and take your test, and not one would. Does that surprise you? No. Why is it? Lots of people think that I scared them really good. Well, not that good. Though Emily's test got publicity, it was published in the prestigious Journal of the American Medical Association. Since then, therapeutic touch is practiced more than ever. 80,000 practitioners, most of them registered nurses, who say they can feel the human energy field by passing their hands over the body. Gee, I'll give them a million dollars if they can prove that. Yeah. All hail James Yeah. So, uh, what happened is Emily did, did some testing for her fourth grade uh, science experiment. By the way, she is, at this point, she's really bored with this test, which is why I'm talking and she doesn't know. I'll explain why later. Um, and uh, so, uh, Dr. Baird from Quackwatch uh, suggested uh, extending the test more subjects, and he talked Scientific American Frontiers into filming most of the testing. Uh, that made JAMA interested in this uh, in, the, in this study, uh, but they were not going to be caught with egg on their face by publishing a kid's study. So they put this through intense peer review. Uh, it was almost a year, and uh, it had to pass by 20 of JAMA's editors in wow. addition, and they had a team of medical statisticians evaluating this. Uh, they came, they found that the power of the test was that it was there was a there was only a chance of one in thirty thousand that Emily's test had missed the ability of their therapeutic practitioners to feel uh, her human energy field. Uh, so, uh, it, uh, and also we had to provide all sorts of information about uh, therapeutic touch because we had to uh, uh, educate all of the, the JAMA people about it. And we had an 800, uh, we had a bibliography, a nanotated bibliography of 800 therapeutic touch articles and, and uh, papers to go with this. And all of that allowed the, uh, the authors, which included Emily because she helped with the the writing to say that further professional use of therapeutic touch is unjustified. A very useful conclusion uh, coming out of John. Uh, of course, uh, the, the fun criticism of Emily's paper was from therapeutic touch practitioners, and they had all kinds of excuses for why the, the results were. Uh, random results, which was 44% uh, correct uh, guesses. <laughs> uh, they claimed that the air conditioning blew Emily's energy field away. <laughs> that Emily was a skeptic and therefore she could control her energy field, turn it on and off to fool the TT practitioners. <laughs> Uh, another one said, well, she's pubescent, so she's got an energy field that's wild and crazy. Uh, but most of them settled on, well, you don't really need to feel the energy field to, to be clinically effective with therapeutic touch. But up to that point, they said, you 
you need to feel it so that you can assess the field, find out where it's uh, problems with the field and correct it. And they claimed that the human energy field was as tactile as taffy and often felt more like warm jello. So, okay. And Larry had to, Larry wrote an article for Skeptic about all, the, um, all of these uh, excuses. Well, it just was a firestorm of media attention. Uh, after 170 uh, distinct articles about the, the, uh, the, ex the experiment and the Java paper, we stopped counting. Uh, everybody was covering uh, this story. And here, Emily did over 30 appearances uh, on television, which is why she's she's tired of <laughs> TV. But she did very well. And interestingly enough, there was one one place where you would expect uh, this to be covered, at least as a little news item, but was totally ignored. And that was Skeptical wow. Inquirer. Nothing. Um, as, as a matter of fact, quite a few skeptics out of Sarkop were not only ignoring this study, but wanted to discredit it. Uh, they, have, they launched a, an experiment to explain why Emily's subjects felt the human, felt, a, felt something, felt a human energy field when Emily's study clearly showed that they weren't feeling anything, they were guessing. So, uh, the implication was that the data for the ROSA study had been fudged, uh, as Ray Hyman here suggests. Whoa. So I was kind of a... Didn't know that, that unfortunately gave uh, <coughs> aid and comfort to the therapeutic touch practitioners, but was largely ignored by others. Uh, we had a lot of fun times, and we did the keynote at the Ignoble. Uh, she accepted the award that went to Dolores Krieger, the inventor of therapeutic touch, thanking her for avoiding doing basic research on therapeutic touch for 25 years so that she, so that little Emily could come by and, uh, and do it and get a hair paper and JAMA. Another uh, delightful outcome is a lot of kids paying attention to uh, therapeutic, uh, uh, working, <laughs> using her <laughs> protocol to have fun with. Uh, and uh, it was, it was a, I hope, uh, an inducement to kids, regular kids, as Emily was, to go out and do science. As uh, JAMA editor said, I was George Lundberg, age doesn't matter, all we care about is good science. And uh, somebody asked Lumberg if they kept track of the ages of, or if Emily was the youngest one. And he said, well, we normally don't ask the age of our uh, authors. Uh, but it got the attention of Guinness World Records, so Emily got the record for the youngest to, um, to publish serious medical research. Um, if you want to know what the real threat to nursing is, it's not therapeutic touch anymore. They've pretty much uh, been relegated to uh, mystical fairs and whatnot. There's, it's not done in hospitals anymore. It doesn't seem like it. However, coming out of Colorado, once again, is the, the Watson's Caring Science. Gene Watson was the, uh, the dean of, the, of CU's School of Nursing in the 1990s when therapeutic touch was really big. 
She has retired and started up her own institute of caring science. She is a not only a nursing therapist, she's a grand nursing therapist. And I'm of the, uh, the camp that thinks nursing doesn't need any therapist at all. Okay. However, uh, her caring science is just total mystical nonsense. But other, the, the nursing profession is taking her very seriously. There are 300 hospitals that are using her um, philosophy of nursing. She's gotten 15 honorary doctorates, and the American Academy of Nursing has declared her a living legend. She came up with this theory when her grandson knocked out one of her eyes with a broom handle. She said, I lost my eye, E-Y-E, -E, which caused me to lose my eye, capital letter I, which led me to lose my ego. And that was the inspiration for caring science. And it's pissed off a lot of older nurses like me because uh, we were caring about patients a long time before she came around. Uh, she's finding that the uh, caring science pays off. Uh, she's, she sells a lot of her books that the cover of that, t <laughs> this book will give you an idea of where she's coming from. And she also has her own line of scrubs. Apparel personally selected by Jean Watson, designed for nurses to energetically and symbolically embody and embrace high vibration consciousness. Whoa, what a deal for a clothes, huh? And they do a lot of training as well, such as at the Children's Hospital. I think she ought to get some award for uh, of using the word, the term science more than anybody else I know. Uh, to show you how goofy this thing is, her caring science has melded with something called heart math, which has to be the goofiest pseudoscience around. They take every metaphor about the heart and concretize it. They believe that the heart is the body's second brain, capable of thought and emotions, uh, that is telepathic and psychic, sends out energy, rhythmic fields, it controls the brain more than the brain controls the heart, and it's proof that love is an advanced intelligence, which feeds into this whole caring science thing. Uh, and unfortunately, heart math has been uh, <coughs> promoted by the American Nurse Today, which is a, the official journal of the American Nurses Association. I don't know. I am so embarrassed as a nurse. Okay, now here's, here's the real kicker, too. Her institute is no longer located in Boulder. It has moved to CU Hospital. So. <laughs> Where she is thought to be a big deal. And have I missed any events of the year? We're starting to facilitate communication. <laughs> we have to, that, is a, that is a problem in Colorado. The state funds a group of facilitated communication, promote, promoters, families, and, and facilitators. That, uh, that's another embarrassment here in the state. And Susan is, has started a group to attack this, and it's looking very promising yes. indeed. I'm very, I'm learning a lot. <laughs> I'm learning a lot from you too, Linda, trust me. It's a good, a good team we're starting to form here. Yeah, yeah, then. Really excited about that. Yes. Do you think these people are more motivated by like financial gain, or do you think they actually believe they're not? Uh, like Gene Watson? Yeah, any of them, basically. Uh, 
Well, uh, the nature pass, there's a lot of money to be made. They are not cheap to go to them. Uh, it, it can cost somebody thousands a month to get their, their treatment. Um, Jean Watson, I think, is just a, a kook. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you know, and the Lyme doctors, that's that's a big uh, money maker as well. Um, so what does naturopath like do? Like aside from the whole they were acting as physicians, what how are they different from a doctor? Like other than they haven't been to medical school, what do they do? Like what do they describe? Um well <coughs> to start off I'll tell you that there's no scope of practice for nature of past. And there are no standards of care. They can do anything they want. And there's nobody to tell them that it is not naturopathy. Uh, they are only limited by their practice act, which will say well, you can't do surgery uh, or or you can't uh, you can't order MRIs or something like that. Uh, but otherwise, if you go to a naturopath, you pick one out of the phone book, there is no way to know how they're going to treat whatever they, or even how they uh, diagnose you. And how do they, like, do they go to a school or something? Like, There are five naturopathic colleges in the United States, which is, <laughs> yes, um, where... Uh, they they claim that they that it's like medical medical school, uh, and if they learn any science, it's just a waste because they come out uh, using uh, unscientific practices. I did a survey uh, for 2012 to find out what the Colorado naturopaths were doing, offering to the public. Uh, I found that uh, there were uh, advice about diet and nutrition was the most common thing they did. The next most common thing was homeopathy, which you know is totally unscientific. So what is homeopathy? Homeopathy. Who would like to? <laughs> oh, God. Well, last God knows about homeopathy. Yeah, last year at Skeptic Camp, I did a presentation. Yeah. And I created my homeopathic. I played my home. I created my homeopathic fear placebo. Now, homeopathy is basically you take you know, It's sort of like a, you know you have a malady. You take a little bit of a hair of the dog that bit you, and then you dilute it and dilute it and dilute it and dilute it. You know, ten to the thirtieth power dilutions or thirty x is pretty common value, and that dilutes a substance all the way to the point where there is not one single molecule of it left. You know, so I, you know, so for my, for my placebo demonstration, you know, I started off, well, well, the malady you're trying to cure is sobriety, so I started with coffee, and then to make the beer hoppy, I put in some lemon, yeah, and then I diluted uh, one you know, like half a half a milliliter of coffee into uh, half a liter of water, and then I did that ten times. So that's ten uh, one in a thousand dilutions created a thir you know created a thirty x dilution. And then, okay, uh, here's your glass of water. That'll be that'll be seventeen dollars, please. Now the principle behind homeopathy <coughs> is that treating a symptom with something that produces the symptom actually cures. Is that what works? Yeah, here at the dog to bit you. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, it's created by, what's his name? Hahnemann? Hahnemann. Yeah, it's yeah. rather mystical <coughs> because they believe, even they believe though there's that the no water has a memory. memory. Yes, which is very potent. The more you dilute it, the stronger it is. Yeah, oh yeah, it's, it's, very, very, potent. Potent. it's a very potent <laughs> brew I made. The, the, the thing that pushed me over the edge to thinking that all homeopaths must be quacks is that one of the standard uh, chemicals used in homeopathy is muriate of natrium mm -hmm. and they charge you like $17 for a little tiny bottle of this stuff but you have to analyze well so what's muriate? 
Muriate is the salt of muriatic acid, which is used to clean swimming pools. It's also known as hyperchloric acid. So muriate just means chloride. What's natrium? It's the Latin name for sodium. It's why the chemical symbol for sodium is Na instead of SO. Yeah, it's table salt, and they sell they sell you like a tiny amount of table salt for like seventeen dollars a bottle, calling it muriate of natrium. And so that, that, that's just a scam. That's just a complete scam. Yeah, I got. I got just one more. Sure. You said yeah, the classic. Yeah, yeah, the classic thing that skeptics do in compared with how homeopathy yeah. and a lot of the messages they do the homeopathic overdose. You know, they go and get some pills from Whole Foods or wherever. You know, and then they just take the entire bottle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, nothing happened. I just, I just want to add one more. Uh, yeah. Susan and I went to the uh, pharmacy museum in Heidelberg, Germany, which is like the epicenter of uh, where Hahnemann samples are. Mm -hmm. And we went to a. a person who works has his own kind of CFI office and he showed us a little bottle that was 30 C and it was uh, uh, the Berlin Wall a piece of the Berlin Wall and it was prescribed for claustrophobia <laughs> it's a real thing you can buy it for like $30 a bottle do you, do you drink it yeah, it's the same thing. It's just it's a, pill. a piece of a, a piece of uh, the Berlin Wall, and they diluted it thirty thousand times. Thirty. Yeah. Yeah. And, How do you and dilute it? The Berlin Wall. It's, it's just, somewhere in there. You know? <laughs> but, but the point you is, you touch it, it on the water. It's I guess prescribed for claustrophobia. We, and we we laughed, and the guy said, "Oh no, it's a real thing. I can get you some samples if you want it." And here in Colorado, we have a naturopath who treats uh, rattlesnake bites with. Homeopathic. Snake venom. Let me guess. Snake venom. Snake venom. Yeah. Snake venom. Yeah. 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 Y
was a clown car of mutual funds. <laughs> uh, are there any other contenders? How about a Trump of nature? Uh, uh, that would hopefully be gone eventually. Yeah, we want something that lasts. Yeah. And a lunacy of nature class. Okay. <coughs> Any other contenders? Well, yeah, I, I, I coined that funny term. I called them a hemoglob because they a lot of times do blood work to diagnose people. So a hemoglob. Oh, that's a good one. A 30X of homeopaths? A what? A 30X of homeopaths? A dilution. 30C. We can only wish. <laughs> okay. Um, You've got paper in hand. Okay. Uh, let's see how many hands for a hemoglob of no naturopaths. Okay. Three. Okay. A scam of naturopaths. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Uh, the clown car of the nation's office. What? You were saying that? Clown car. Oh, clown car. I like clown car. Okay. Uh, the others? Uh, okay. 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 Uh, okay.